Good morning, everybody. What an amazing time this is. It's been a long time since we sat down together. COGX June 2021, to be precise. That's crazy. A lot have changed. Uh, we can see everyone's faces. Uh, there's no masks. I can see your face, but I also know that you, your face has been on the side of a bus in Switzerland since then. DeepMind used to be about nature papers. Now it's about Time 100 faces. It used to be just about DeepMind, and now it's also about Google DeepMind. I'm thrilled to be here with Library Ibrahim. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you as we think about Google DeepMind's new Diet Coke level uh, recognition and increased responsibility. We're going to get to the responsibility, my very favorite topic. But first, I think we should start with the science. DeepMind is known and deeply in my heart for solving problems that humans have not yet been able to solve alone. I went on maternity leave just as um, I left COGX, and AlphaFold revealed the structure of the protein universe. Uh, not that anyone was shocked or anything, um, but what's been happening since? I've been in a baby bubble, a Cambridge bubble, and I want to get a little bit of an update in front of all of you, so you guys can get an update if you were also in your own bubble. Um, technological progress, what's excited you the most in the last few years? Well, uh, thank you, Tabitha. It's wonderful to be back here with you yeah. um, and with everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, there certainly has been quite a bit of change, and it's uh, exciting to see the progress that AI is uh, making, that we're making with AI, and unlocking our understanding of the world and advancing in areas that we, uh, not too long ago, thought would be impossible. Mm -hmm. I think AlphaFold, you brought that up. AlphaFold is actually a really great example um, to be able to accurately predict the 3D structure of a protein and how it might fold and misfold has really helped us in understanding uh, diseases, um, how we might fight uh, industrial pollution, uh, plastic, and we've already found over a million researchers in 190 countries are actively using this wow. free database uh, to advance science. We like to think of it as a science at digital speed. And so I think when you kind of take a step back and look at some of the challenges our world is facing and health and understanding diseases as one of those key areas, it's quite exciting to think of where are we at with AlphaFold, but also we're just still quite early in the journey. And I think it's going to be, I'm quite ho hopeful about what the community of, of scientists around the world are, are where they're, how they're making progress in this space. Another area I'm particularly excited about is some of the focus on uh, using AI towards uh, climate and sustainability. Next week I'll be um, in New York for the United Nations efforts where I suspect much of the conversation will be how do we start closing the gap towards the sustainable development goals and climate and the environment being one of the major uh, concerns that we have. And if you think about where and how we can use AI in this space, we can use AI to build better models, have a better understanding of the world around us. Um, an example here might be um, some work we've done with the UK government, uh, the UK Met Office around weather prediction, which as an American from California, I'm very excited about <laughs> to have some better uh, understanding of the weather. Uh, weather models and the particular focus was within a 90 minute window. The uh, 50 meteorologists have now selected uh, our research work and uh, collaboration as the most accurate and best predictor of what's going to happen. Um, so understanding what's happening around us with the better models. The second area is how do we just optimize existing infrastructure? Uh, we have done some work within Google uh, to optimize the data centers to gain power efficiencies, um, energy savings that are also reflected then in, in the, the costs as well as the planet. And that's been quite exciting too to think about where and how can we use AI to optimize existing infrastructure. And I know a lot of organizations are focused on this as well. And then we can think about how do we use AI, much like AlphaFold, to unlock the science and um, advances and scientific breakthroughs. Uh, last year, we did some work uh, around um, nuclear fusion and just being able to control multiple points of plasma, like 10,000 manipulations per minute, 
um, real time on some, you know, and this is not going to solve the problem, but it's an important step. And I think there's an opportunity here of how can we generate new power sources? What might we be, solutions might we be able to come up with that aren't quite clear to us yet? Mm. So I think there's an example of uh, in health via AlphaFold and more generally in the climate environment of some of the work that uh, we at Google DeepMind, um, uh, along with many others in the ecosystem, are putting their efforts towards. Yeah. Few, all things that we need as individuals and that the world clearly needs. I think also the world definitely needs AI to take, figure out how it's going to in reduce its own impact on the environment. Is that part of the projects? Yeah, uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, so there's, maybe I can, um, Think about, I think about this in a couple of ways. The first is, what could we be doing internally? Yeah. Um, we have, we're fortunate to have access to the Google infrastructure, as I mentioned, with a data center, but we can also, you know, how do we manage our workloads of our research? Mm. Um, how do we even do things over the past few years? We've brought the information about compute consumption, more being more transparent with our researchers, which has then turned them into thinking, how do we be more efficient in our models? Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of work happening internally uh, from that perspective. Um, and then how do we also try to think about um, AI to create solutions? as well to this problem. And again, it's not just one organization. This needs many organizations. So how can we use these data, these examples, mm. um, like the data center, as a way to encourage others to think big and to think what, can, what might now be possible? So yes, I think the supply chain, whether it's from um, chip design to data centers on the infrastructure to the scientists who are developing these algorithms, um, even how we operate our offices with my COO hat on, yeah. we, we have to be thinking about this. It's not, mm. it's not a silver bullet. And I think we, within the AI field, play an important role. Yeah, I think we do. It's so difficult. I've been working in Cambridge on the supporting the ecosystem to come up with a strategy for good, sustainable, inclusive, green growth. And every time we think of growth, we have to remind ourselves that that equals potentially uh, putting pressure on our net zero targets. It's a, it's a really tough balance. Um, on the health front, it feels like, you know, did you say a million scientists working on, that's just amazing. And have you seen companies spun out of that as well? Yeah, um, and actually, even the, the scientists, we've done a lot of work in mm. trying to make the AlphaFold database more accessible. So right. working with, um, in the Global South, with some of the folks on neglected diseases as well. So it's been a concerted effort of ours of really of empowering the ecosystem with this. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's quite, a, quite, quite a feat. Yeah, amazing to see. And so with all of that going on and the Google DeepMind merge, your responsibility that I endowed on you last time we were here in 2020, uh, 2021 has, has, has sort of tenfold increased as well as your um, remit. How do we ensure that, that you're building safe, responsible technology yourselves at DeepMind? Yeah, it, it's much like you were talking uh, about the mm. holding things in tension, right? Yeah. Like, how do you pioneer a new technology while being responsible? Um, for those of you who don't know, I've spent 30 years in, in tech and was very deliberate about choosing this role at this time uh, when I joined uh, what was DeepMind uh, five and a half years ago. And it was really built on a belief that transformational technology, which I believe AI is, requires exceptional care. And we have worked very hard um, to, you know, you can have principles, I think a lot of organizations have principles, but actually putting that into action uh, takes, it, it's not always the sexy work, but it's, the, it's so important and critical. Mm. Uh, so we think about it in a framework of three, and I'm going to share it here if, uh, if that's okay. Because I think it's useful for all of you as uh, leaders, participants um, in your industries to, to be thinking about how do you actually operationalize responsibility. And we think of it in terms of first, responsible governance, responsible research, and responsible imp impact. On responsible governance, um, it, 
it's, you, you need to have the processes in place, and we have something called our um, Institutional Review Committee, which is a multi-stakeholder group within uh, Google DeepMind that gets together, and we do reviews at the start of the research and throughout in collaboration with our research teams. And when we don't have expertise or the right voices around the room or we think there might be some downstream impact, we pull in people from the outside to give us advice and guidance. Um, so uh, this responsible governance is instrumental, and I start with that because to have governance really work is a cultural thing. It's not just about having the process. You actually, I think this is really an important part of leadership and culture, building culture. The second part is uh, responsible research. Um, now, you, we talked about more of the technical research of having these, these checkpoints, but also it's creating the space for research in areas that might be um, underrepresented. We've done work in queer fairness, decolonial AI. Um, we have, we held back on our language paper of publishing it, our technical paper, until we had a paper around taxonomy of how do we talk about the risks and the opportunities. So I think, again, that as just how do you think about research as the part and then impact. When we were um, releasing, when we were trying to um, assess AlphaFold in our um, institutional review committee, we weren't sure if it was net positive or what risk there might be. So we sought input from over three dozen um, experts from the field of biology who actually encouraged us to um, uh, release it and helped us make the connections to the European Bioinformatics Labs, who are experts in this space, um, in the way that we um, deployed this and were active participants in a lot of the global standards on this topic as well, because I think it's important to do that. So um, these are this framework might be helpful for you. Mm. I think it's not something you bolt on, and, oh, we've done this research, now what? <laughs> uh, but rather, how do you build it in yeah. from the start, much like what you were talking about in your own work. Yeah, and the, um, the impact piece, I've, I, I think my favorite recent was the watermarking, where, where actually it's, the, it's sort of eating your own dog food and figuring out, okay, if we're putting something out into the world, how do we help people understand we're putting out these things into the world? Where do ideas like that come from? How, how, do, how do those um, uh, needs get heard within an organization where you're also trying to solve for you know, world peace and, and, and uh, climate change and, and, and uh, cancers? Well, I think that's part of the cultural aspect yeah. of can you, if you have the culture where you can let ideas flourish and something like um, synth ID, which you're refer referring mm. to, like we, we know that trust of AI systems is a big topic for the public and we have to bring the public along if, if AI has, is going to have the potential to do good. So what are some of the challenges that we just need to address? And that is how um, synth ID came about, which is uh, watermarking uh, pilots that we, we've recently released so that you know if something is, um, comes from a generative media. Um, you know, and another example is we've done a lot of work around the language, visual language mm -hmm. of AI. So again, um, you know, when I started uh, five and a half years ago, all the imagery was super dark and killer robots and computer, like chip designs that look back like my electrical engineering days. But you don't like the godlike finger? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, human meets godlike thing about you. Yeah, no, yeah, no it's, uh, it, it, yeah. So we, what we did actually, um, exactly, you, everyone has got this imagery in their mind. What we, what we did is we worked with a bunch of artists, a group of artists, yeah. and said, can you help us create a new visual language for this? And uh, we've now made that freely available. It's called Viz AI. I've, saw, I've seen some imagery so, uh, around, uh, but it's just, it's making, it's, trying to mm. show the potential the, of what AI can be. Of course, we have to mitigate the risk, but we have mm. to be able to talk about this opportunity, this transformative opportunity we have that we're gonna pass down for generations as well as the risk that's happening. Yeah. And on many people's minds uh, will be government's role in this. So we've got right now in America, the Schrader's AI Insight Forums. We've got the, what, the European regulation. We've got the AI Summit in November. What role do you see for regulators now? What progress are you hoping to see in the next few months? Yeah, I, th um, I think AI we've, is such a transform transformative technology that we have to regulate it. It's a matter of how do you right-size the regulation yeah. so that you can 
make use of its potential um, while mitigating the risk. And I think there's been a lot of really great regulatory work that's happened around the world on other technologies that we can build from. A few things come to mind. First of all, that um, this is a technology that is not you can't bound it to one country. When we were working on some of the internet development in the 90s and early 2000s, like we could have more national level regulation. Yeah. AI isn't anything that we can contain, so we need to take a multinational approach to this uh, international approach. So I think that that's actually going to be really critical and very much a context-driven approach, I think, is going to be helpful because how you want to regulate AI really depends on the context in which it's being um, utilized. Yeah, and we see a lot of labs and DeepMind being like right at the center in the room. I have a bit of a fear that the civil society is not as involved as maybe it should be. I actually joined the Luminate board because I was panicked about this and I, I, I saw that as an opportunity. How are you making sure that the right people have got their voices in the room? I, that's, um, I, I think you've, you're bringing up such an important point. This isn't, also, uh, it's not just the gover governments talking to governments. We have to include business. We have to include academia, uh, civil society. We've been doing a lot of work. I'm, I think one of the cool things about DeepMind, and um, uh, I, I think a lot about this is uh, being based in headquartered in London and from mm. the very beginning of how do you think about the society around you. It's just kind of been baked into how we do things. We worked with the Aspen Institute to do some work on a blueprint for equitable AI, where we brought together diverse groups to actually talk about what does it even mean to be equitable with AI, and published a couple reports in collaboration mm. with them. And um, you know, I think Phys AI is another example of how do we start building these bridges and knowing that we can't just have technologists talking to technologists, we actually need to bring mm -hmm. other voices in, in a way that is going to help us build better solutions. Yep. This isn't easy, but it's important. And I think one of the biggest things that's changed um, uh, in the past few years is within the past 12 months of really shifting the public conversation. And it's part of the reason why it's so great to see so many of you here today, just knowing that you can be thinking about how do you take your work, um, pull in others who might not otherwise uh, have a seat at the table and, and have conversations about what could this technology be and how could it be used. And a lot of ways, I feel like my job uh, you know, I have an unusual job at, at DeepMind as COO. I might see, or I oversee the operations, but also all of our responsibility efforts, all of our governance efforts, and how we partner with the external world. And I don't have, you know, my AI story really started five and a half years ago. So bringing that diverse perspective mm. from other technology sectors, venture capital, um, startups into uh, into what we do has been really, I feel like, has been a key part of my role. Yeah, and I'm I'm very. I'm very glad that that is part of your role. And even just the conversation we've had just now shows that you know, back in 2021, we spoke a lot about the dystopian utopian swing. I think now today in the next three days of COGX, there'll be a lot of existential risk and existing risk. And I think you have really beautifully described the fact that both are important. Um, let's leave everyone with one final thought on how you see this playing out in the next 10 years, what, what can people here do to make sure that we do find a good balance on the harms that are happening today and the wonderful things that are happening today, as well as those, uh, those things that potentially Yova Harari next might be talking about? <laughs> um, well, thank you. I, I think if I could just pick up mm. from your last comment, um, we, talking about the near-term risks, I think has been um, important and the long-term doesn't seem so long from now, so finding ways to bridge between the two and have the dialogue, to me that is being responsible if we mm. can talk about both the opportunity and the risk. How do we maximize the opportunities in a way where we can create a better uh, world for the generation and generations um, that we're here. One area that I'm particularly excited about is in the space of education. Um, you know, as a, um, as a mom of teenage daughters, I think a lot about what world uh, they're going to be operating in. And within Google DeepMind, we've recently done some work with the Raspberry Pi Foundation um, to uh, something called Experience AI, where we've piloted this, um, how do you start closing the gap and bring people who might not have otherwise had access to this technology that's going to change their 
the, op their, the way they live, the way they work, the way they play, every, the way that uh, they are. So um, we've piloted this in the UK uh, to 130,000 age 11 to 14 year olds. We're looking at how we can expand it. But I think this is going to be an important question. Mm -hmm. It's we've got to be thinking about what we're doing here and now, but also how do we bring others into this conversation? If we don't, we're propagating, I think, um, further challenges for the world where we need to be able to, to, to do what we, to build the foundations, but also leave, in, leave the world in a better place for those, uh, those who will follow. Thank you so much. That's exactly how I will continue my day, next few days, and hopefully a uh, career, thinking through how do we hold those two tensions in the same, uh, in the same thought. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your COGX, and um, we'll see you soon, maybe at the next one. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much.